Welcome to the Rooftop Podcast. Um, been a long couple of days, that's for sure. Um, kind of a different format today. I thought it would be a different format um, for a couple of reasons. Is I want to I want to talk about this whiteboard that you see behind me, and um, I want to start by talking uh, about what's happened with this is part of the Afghan series, and uh, I don't know if it'll be the conclusion, but it's definitely winding up. Um, you know, it's, uh, I'm sitting here looking all disheveled because I'm pretty disheveled, uh, very long night, um, uh, not a lot of sleep, not any sleep as, uh, a fairly large number of green berets, Navy SEALs, uh, retired combat veterans from a range of Marine special ops, uh, Afghan, uh, refugees who have made their way here, Afghan citizens, um, reporters, State Department folks, I mean, just this uh, congressional staffers, eclectic group of people known as Task Force Pineapple, who along with other informal organic groups doing these amazing things, um, have been pulling Afghans in uh, out of harm's way and, um, and into the perimeter of the airfield uh, in Kabul International. And, and let me be clear, no way that could have been done without the heroic efforts of unofficial heroes from the State Department, from the Marine Corps, from the British military, from uh, certainly the 82nd Airborne, um, just a range of people who, although their orders from the U U.S. government said, you know, do, you know, do not engage, do not push forward, maintain a different defensive posture, these people made the decision that they were not going to leave anybody behind just like we did and they became the other side of what was essentially an underground railroad um we found a way as task force pineapple to move uh, afghans and american citizens who were in duress to through through the taliban infested checkpoints of kabul and then into proximity of um the, the gate, which was surrounded by Taliban and tens of thousands of people. And you just got to imagine this, tens of thousands of people standing shoulder to shoulder and then into a sewage-filled canal where entire families of commandos, Afghan special forces, Afghan interpreters um, would wade through, you know, waste deep sewage um, to bypass Taliban checkpoints. Some of them would walk through Taliban checkpoints and endure beatings uh, beatings of their wife, beatings of their small children, being kicked by the Taliban, butt stroked with weapons, some of them shot, stabbed. Uh, they would endure those beatings and then press through the checkpoint to the next checkpoint. And some of them in, endured horrific beatings, um, sat sitting out in the, in the, in the, in the Kandahar, or excuse me, the, the, the Afghan sun for hours, if not days at a time with no food, no water, with little ones, some women eight, nine months pregnant. Some women had uh, gave birth at the, at, the, at the perimeter of the airfield trying to get in, some on the flight lines. But um, you know what united them all was what? Was trying to get out of a country that is so brutally oppressive that they would wade through sewage and allow their entire family to be beaten at a checkpoint for just a sliver of a chance to stand in a line that is thousands of people wide and deep to get on a plane to take them away from this hell hole that they're in. So when, when I hear the administration talking about all the thousands that they evacuated and everything, I just be careful, be careful because I've been you know working at the ground level on this from the beginning. And what I can tell you is there are thousands and thousands and thousands of um, Afghans who are in duress, who we made a commitment to help out and who put their neck out there for us and their country and are at high risk for execution. There are also American citizens, British citizens, uh, you know, Western citizens as well that have not been recovered, nor will they likely be recovered by the supposed deadline that's coming up. Um, but, you know, this, this morning for us, at least, um, I don't know, around 10 o'clock Eastern time, maybe a little bit earlier, it, 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 you know, it was catastrophic because there was a, a massive explosion, a suicide bomber that we believe is from ISIS, uh, detonated at the Abbey Gate, this checkpoint with throngs of people and uh, massive casualties, massive casualties to include U.S. casualties. 
Um, and it's just horrific, you know, it's just a horrific end to a horrific course of action that has been put in place. And even with that, you know, even with that horrific bombing, the Afghans still stayed, still pressed, looked for ways out of the country. Now, what does that say about an incoming government? What does that say about a regime when people are taking those kinds of actions, hanging on to the landing gear of jet airplanes and falling off at a thousand feet, wading through sewage, being blown up and then getting back in line bloody? What does that say? little six-year-old girls wading through sewage as orphans. I'll just let those sink in because those are the realities that I've been watching come across this cell phone on this classified or not classified, but encrypted app for seven days. Stories of commandos and Afghan special forces and interpreters and other uh, partners, um, female judges, female prosecutors, uh, female teachers who stood up and tried to advance what they were doing in a, in a very, very powerful way and were, you know, are being hunted. Um, and, and so what I will tell you is um, what was happening before that explosion, though, really restored my faith in humanity. This little task force that we call Task Force Pineapple that started uh, with this whiteboard that you see behind me here that normally has rooftop leadership stuff on it became a course of action sketch. Uh, I don't even know how many days ago when Space Monkey was in duress, that was the original course of action sketch that was sketched up there. Um, you see the X behind me there, that's the, uh, that's the airfield and then that's the perimeter around the airfield. Um, back over here was his safe house that we had to kind of move him from. And then of course, over here, you know, is the, uh, the, the airplane that took him ultimately to Cutter. And the real challenge was this perimeter around the airfield right there. Really, really tough to get by. Each day that passed, it became harder. We used a code word called pineapple that was provided to us from the inside by collaborating with these across the, you know, into the airport and finding people that were willing to defy, you know, bureaucratic orders and do the right thing. Uh, and we used the word pineapple when we got him in. That began Task Force Pineapple. I want to show you something else, too, because I feel like I don't know when I'll, I'll ever have another chance to show this. And this is a little bit unorthodox, but I'm going to turn this and see if you can see it. Um, I don't know if you can see um, that whiteboard there, but, you know, that's a that's a participant diagram. Uh, as I started to look at this complex uh, problem, you see up there, it says and this may be showing up as backward, but it says hashtag hashtag save space monkey. So that was me naming the problem save space monkey. And then I started to write up there um, a couple of people who I knew could help, uh, former or actually active duty Green Berets, Will and Mike. And then I started to think, okay, there's Congressman Waltz. I got in touch with his staffer. Um, there's a USAID person I can bring in. Um, there is um, a State Department. There's a reporter that I can bring in that knows him and knows people in high places. And we put together uh, this little group in a chat room that's encrypted. Uh, that's available in the app store <laughs> and uh, we started working the problem and um, you know we started way over here uh, with you know uh, our guy hiding in the, in, the, in, in the attic of his uncle's house like Anne Frank and we ultimately got enough of a network in place that we were able to move him through the city with a clandestine movement and then ultimately to this perimeter right here and then using technology and relationships and, you know, collaboration, we got someone to come out and uh, do near recognition with pineapple and he got on the inside and then we got him manifested. We brought some people in that worked the manifests. Then we brought his family in separately the next day. As we looked at that, we thought, wow, what if we just kept this task force open and just continued to do that? And we did that. We left it open and all these um, green berets that were retired uh, SEALs that were retired, um, Marine special ops that were retired, and others, uh, civilians came in who had experience doing this kind of thing, and we already had an apparatus in place, and Task Force Pineapple was up and running, um, and, and, and we started working, you know, working issues, and the way we did it was we had a couple of amazing retired um, senior NCOs, sergeants who had done this kind of work, and what they did was everybody that had a relationship with an interpreter, everybody that had a relationship with a commando or groups of them and their families, they were assigned as shepherds 
Um, and I can talk about this now because the operation is pretty much over, but these shepherds were responsible. The lifeline was this phone right here because we could, uh, we could use, you know, open source technology to pinpoint checkpoints and map things and, you know, give reporting in real time of what other people were seeing. And we networked very fast. Um, and it was kind of fun to network faster than the, uh, the, uh, the uh, draconian thugs that are now trying to govern, um, that were always kind of running circles around us doing the same thing. And we did it to them. Um, and uh, we definitely out Taliban the Taliban uh, with this one. And, uh, and it, the proof is in the pudding. We got 500 people out in one night um, and we created an, uh, so once we, um, you know, once we created this network of task force pineapple, each of those people was called a shepherd. And then we had one, coordinator that uh, started working relationships inside the wire. He built relationships with unofficial heroes who were willing to basically defy standing orders of bureaucracy and reach across the fence, wade into a canal, go to a hole in the wall. And uh, as a conductor, we called it on the other side and pull people through, pull people through and, um, and, um, and, and bring them into the safety of Kabul International Airport. And then from there, you know, really do what was needed to get them manifested and then flown out of there. So what we did was face monkey and we just rinsed and repeated it. And we did it again and again and again. And by the end of this week, like last night, we were moving uh, 500 people out of here through holes in the wire that would not have gotten out. There's no way that it would have gotten out. And these weren't just, I mean, I don't want to say just Afghans, but these were Afghan commandos. These were Afghan special forces. These were Afghan um, special forces interpreters and their families, uh, but also highly at risk uh, women who did not have male representation, who had taught, who had been prosecutors, um, American citizens, American green, coal, green card holders. We moved uh, children from orphanages. We, we attempted everything we could possibly find, but all of them had a shepherd that was responsible for being their eyes and ears. And, and, and they would have to wait for hours and hours with no food and water and loiter near the gate. And then when the conductor would show up at the Underground Railroad that we call the Pineapple Express, would move through, uh, would move through that wire and whatever the hole was, and it rotated all the time. And these poor people would have to move from site to site, sometimes for hours at a time, sometimes a two hour walk with two year old children in tow. Um, but what happened was we never gave up on each other. We never gave up on the relationships. We never, and they trusted us and we trusted them. And I just wanna throw a shout out to the amazing, amazing crew of Task Force Pineapple. Um, I don't know if the world will ever know your story beyond this, but what a story, what a story it is and what a testament to humanity and what a testament to relationships and what a testament, as far as I'm concerned, when I talk about rooftop leadership, that's everything that I talk about are the leaders who step into the arena and are willing to take a chance and dare greatly, even if um, it means failing, failing. And in many cases, we did fail. We didn't accomplish it. We left many people behind. We didn't get anywhere near the number of people out that we wanted to. Um, and that will haunt me to my dying day. You know, I'm not assigning blame right now. There will be a time for that because I'm going to do that. I'm going to talk about what's been done here because I think it's morally reprehensible. Um, and I normally don't do that. I normally don't, but I'm going to, and I'm going to be nonpartisan about it. And I hope that the American people and our friends in the West will hear this. One other thing to just talk about, you know, going on media platforms, like I'm not an experienced media person. I, I go on the media because I think it's a story that needs to be told that no other voice will tell. Um, and, and I have a unique perspective that I can do that because I'm still in the arena, still doing what I do. Um, but I, I went on British media a couple of times just to talk about, you know, because they're NATO and they're out there doing what we're doing and talked about the Pineapple Express and the recognition signals. They had seen the, the Pineapple Express on BBC. They had heard it on British radio, the British troops. And we actually had a lot of Afghans let in yesterday because they had seen the segments on British television and British radio. And I'm just uh, overwhelmed with the amount of collaboration and work that went on between the private and public sector. But I want to be clear, it was not an overt collaboration in the public sector in the sense that the government was all on board and the administration was driving it and Republicans and Democrats were working together. In fact, it was the opposite. In fact, I think that the administration right now would have you believe that tens of thousands were flown out and, and we pretty much got everybody out. It's not true. It's just not true. There are thousands and thousands and thousands who are left in duress and who are probably going to be executed. 
uh, people who we agreed to care for. Uh, American citizens got left behind an unprecedented amount. So, and that's from guys who like have been on the ground, like, you know, in the trenches working this nonstop. I mean, we know because now we're going to be moving them out of the country and we already are. Um, we're, you know, we're already moving them in different, in different directions and we're going to need help. You know, we're going to need help from the, it's going to be the private sector because right now the government's not going to do anything. The U.S. government has no appetite and has stated so publicly, they have no appetite in helping the Afghan people escape this genocide that they're going to go through and we're just not standing for that you know the the vet and i listen i would there's nothing i'd rather do than get back to talking about rooftop leadership and rooftop podcasts that you and i were talking about all the time you know i, I don't really want any more course of action sketches on my whiteboard i did enough of those when i was on active duty i'm 53 right i'll let the young men and women handle that but until the right thing is done and until we move people out of there out of harm's way and into some kind of relative safety where they have a chance at freedom and at least a better life or at least living um i'm not we're just not going to leave them we're just not going to do that and if it means you know shuttering up my business and my nonprofit and my film being delayed then so be it you know because um we took an oath a long time ago um to to do this kind of work and uh and and to stand by each other so i'm just going to put it out there so um I hope this helps. I hope you've uh, learned something from these uh, podcasts. We'll continue to do more as it's necessary, but uh, really proud of the people in our country uh, that stood up. And thank you for supporting us in whatever way that you did. I'll see you on the rooftop.